lot of the fears, especially that you see in pop culture, come from the worry that humans will become obsolete. And I think it's really interesting to compare that to a lot of traditional fears around women gaining power in the social sphere. Because oftentimes one of the things that um, a sexist culture has said about women is that, well, once women gain power and once women take over, they won't need men anymore. Men will be obsolete because we'll just all be. <laughs> terrifying technology, it is often associated with women, and the first scary robot movie ever is, of course, Metropolis, which is about a scary female robot taking over and leading people astray. Um, and you, you sort of see that again and again, so I do think that there is, that there's a kind of connection there, that we're worried that something that we think of as being beneath us, or being, you know, we want to have robot slaves, that they'll suddenly gain consciousness and form like a robot limb movement. Um, and have to contend with them wanting to vote and you know, having reproductive rights and things like that. The internet is like sex. The person who uses it for uh, communication, but now we use it for fun. <laughs> and it, it occurred to me that what we're really seeing here is it's very well known. People, there's not just evolution of people, but there's a selfish gene, and the genes themselves try to spread, and they try to spread into the population. And to some extent, what I see happening is we're trying to spread ourselves, we're trying to establish a presence, and so even if I'm busy, you can go see me on Facebook, or you can see my photos on Flickr, you can ping me, and maybe I'll actually be synchronously present in real time, but somehow we have this drive to not all of us, but many of us, to be spread ourselves, not just physically, but now into whatever you want to call the blogosphere or the cyberspace or whatever. I mean, it's kind of a truism at this point to say that until the internet uh, you know, brought people together in new ways, there were all kinds of lonely people who had obscure interests that they felt no one would ever share. And suddenly in the 90s, they went online and discovered, wow, there's an entire Usenet group devoted to my very narrow sexual fetish for balloons, um, or <laughs> my very narrow focus on, you know, Dungeons and Dragons modules from the 1970s. And now I'm not alone. I'm not the only person in my town who wants to play, you know, the AD&D <clears throat> version one. Sorry, I'm just picking on Dungeons and Dragons, but, um, I, and I think, but I think that that is an incredibly positive force, and I think it's an anti-selfish force. And I, I think that's the sort of utopian side of this technology. And, but I also think there is a selfish side. I'm not trying to be you know, blind and foolish here, but I definitely think that, that our, our best urges are being brought out by this technology as well as some of our worst. You know, cockroaches run faster than they're in the presence of other cockroaches, <laughs> all other things being equal. Yeah, and so, you know, so I think when you build the social technology that allows you to feel the presence of other people in that same space, and which we are seeing the beginning of that, you know, you feel that kind of invigoration, you that kind of like, you know, being alive, but it's not just you're alone today. And you really, I think, uh, the newer uh, things like Ajax, the rich interfaces that have happened, you know, that have really built for that. So in, in my you know, that's the test for me. So when you feel the presence of other people at the same time, that's uh, a strong enough connection with it. Yeah. I think a lot of blogging and a lot of online journalism is motivated by people's dismay with the mainstream media. People sense that the mainstream media is corrupt, that it's in the pocket of big business or it's in the pocket of the government. Um, and or ill-informed. Or just <laughs> ill-informed, or, or uh, fake research, or you know, fake reporting. Um, and I think that, that this has always been true in the United States. We've always had an underground press, and we've always had an alternative press, an independent press, that questioned um, corporate media. And now, the difference is, you don't have localized alternative press, and you don't have the weekly papers, well, you do kind of have weekly papers still, but it's not as much um, our source of alternative information. Now we're broadcasting it internationally. And so alternative information that at one point would have been handed out on a street corner in New York or San Francisco, now can reach everyone. And I think that that's very encouraging 
and it's certainly um, empowering. Uh, the flip side of that is, um, I think sometimes we get so caught up in our love of this utopian idea that we will all be freely expressing ourselves, that we'll all be telling the truth, that we forget that all of those old problems with the mainstream media uh, have moved into uh, web media. And you still have uh, mainstream blogs and mainstream publications online that get far more, uh, unfairly more attention than they should, uh, as opposed to uh, good, solid sources of alternative information, often that's coming from the ground in locations like Baghdad, uh, that are trustworthy sources, but because Fox has so much money to put into their online properties as well as their offline properties, you still hear that voice more loudly. Um, I mean, to, to your point about, and to your point about some expression, I wrote a post about the speaker we couldn't get here because she's under house arrest in China, and her blog is blocked in China. Uh, she has a blogger blog, I think. But she can send posts to it from her cell phone that make it onto the blog that people outside China can read to know what's happening with both she and her husband, who has been both. If, her name is uh, Zheng Jinyan, uh, and if you search on Blogger, I wrote a post about the speaker who we couldn't get here. Um, and so that's, I mean, there's something incredibly powerful about what that tool is good for, that um, her government can't stop her. You know. When combined with human courage, there, there's no place for that. Right, right. Um, recently, when um, LiveJournal deleted a bunch of Harry Potter fanfic sites, um, and those are sites, that, not sites, but groups, where people were writing fan fiction about Harry Potter, uh, and they had deleted them because they thought that they were pornographic, because they involved romances between underage people. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was ridiculous. And again, there are so many Harry Potter fans on LiveJournal that they just mailbombed uh, the folks running this campaign to delete the Harry Potter fan fiction. And finally, Barack basically was like, Okay, I'm sorry we totally screwed up. Have all your Harry Potter fans look back. Okay, it's all done now. Um, and, and it was a great triumph. I mean, it's, again, I mean, it's a small community, but they had a huge impact. And they, you know, they wrote to journalists and they posted about it on their blogs and they said, look, you know, this kind of censorship is absurd and it could go beyond Harry Potter fanfic. I mean, obviously, you know, we should protect Harry Potter speech, but really what they were talking about is <laughs> stuff like your blog, where it's something that could be mistaken for pornography and deleted, even though in fact it's providing educational information. Um, so I think that, that those kinds of user revolts that have been very successful can provide models to have virtual sit-ins and to have mailing campaigns and posting campaigns that really get a lot of attention.